I want to thank uh, Dr. Sabu for giving me this opportunity to speak on a subject which is uh, close to my heart. Uh, I know there are not many engineers in this group, so I will uh, try and uh, pitch my uh, presentation, which I'm going to give uh, as if I'm speaking to a non-technical uh, group. Uh, I have a presentation to upload, which I will do in the next one or two minutes. But before that, let me say that uh, technologies are always being developed uh, to essentially to make a progress and advancement. And they have an impact on the quality of our life. Some of the technologies, of course, can be disruptive in nature. Uh, they have an adverse effect on the style of our life sometimes even on the core values which we have imbibed over the years. Many technologies are being developed in India, uh, de novo, right from the beginning, while some technologies which are developed elsewhere are being adapted to Indian requirements by our scientists and our, by engineers. You can all, technology is a very vast field uh, you can group them as uh, technologies pertaining to life sciences, pharmaceutical, engineering, um, aviation, defense, space, marine. So you can have different groups uh, of the various technologies which are uh, being developed. But I'm going to look at the group which is pertaining to green, technologies as well as technologies which make our life more safe. This is my uh, theme today. I had told uh, Dr. Sabo that I will uh, uh, speak on five te technologies that have been developed in India. I've selected five of them out of the many which are uh, in that list. But by the time I prepared the presentation, I realized I need to have one more. So I have made a small change, my topic to make cover six technologies. I uh, would cover the presentation about 40 minutes. And thereafter, if there are any questions and answers, I'll be very happy to. Uh, so I will uh, share the screen uh, of my presentation uh, now. Uh, are you able to see the presentation now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, first yes. slide. Yes, yes, exactly. Okay. Right. So as I told you, I'm going to speak on uh, six new indigenous technologies. Technologies have been uh, adapted to Indian requirement, technologies which are under trials, technologies which are just about to be inducted. They're in various stages. So let me start the presentation uh, by going to the first slide, I'm going to speak uh, as of now, when India is at 75 uh, years, we are the fifth largest economy GDP wise in the world. All of you know that we are uh, overtaken UK also in the last 10 days. We're at $3.53 trillion uh, GDP. But the important aspect is if you look at the sectorial breakdown of this GDP, agriculture is 17%, industry is 26%, and services are 57%. So in the services, a lot of issues are there, uh, which are pertaining to IT, health, uh, tourism, uh, etc. So in that services sector, one important component is called digital economy. This is a relatively new term. It has been there only for the last five years. This term pertains to those aspects of economy which are having a digital operation or a digital backbone. It is pertaining to banking. It is pertaining to governance these days. It is pertaining to IT sector. And it is expected that our digital economy will grow itself to nearly 0.8 trillion by 2030. 
but the important aspect is that the digital applications are coming in agriculture also. You must have seen that these days uh, drones are being used by agriculturists. In the engineering production side also, digital is coming in a big way, be it for design or be it for production or quality control. So digital economy has got influence not only in services, but also in agriculture, but also in industry, relatively uh, a lower level. Therefore, digital infrastructure is very crucial to us, very, very crucial to us. And the indigenous development of new technologies in this field is vital, especially uh, when you want to make it secure, when you want to widen it to pan-Indian status. We want everyone in this country, every village in this country to be connected digitally. So digital infrastructure is very critical to us. And I will be discussing a couple of technologies pertaining to digital uh, today. The second aspect which I want to say, and I want uh, all of you to just uh, remember, that our dependence on fossil fuel or crude oil needs to be reduced. Not only because it is having high carbon emission, but also because it is very expensive because we have to import a lot of oil. Our indigenous production at Bombay High, as well as in Krishna Kaveri Basin, it's slowly depleting and we don't have enough oil from these two areas. So we have to depend on imported oil and it is therefore important for us to reduce our dependence, find something else which will enable us to have all the applications with less oil. So the second technology is pertaining to new type of fuels, which will also give greener, that's why they're called greener energy. <laughs> they will have less emission as compared to petrol or diesel. So this is the second technology which you would like to do. I will be covering three technologies pertaining to green in my presentation. And of course, the last one which I added yesterday is also digital, which I will cover in the end. We have an international commitment. Why I'm saying this is we have a major international commitment, which was uh, declared by our Prime Minister in November 21 at Glasgow, the COP26 meeting, that we will produce renewable energy of 500 gigawatts and reduce carbon footprint by 1 billion ton by 2030. Renewable energy means for India, it's mostly wind as well as sun, solar. So with this background, let me go to the first, let me go to the first uh, technology. This is just a summary, three technologies in digital and three technologies in green. First digital technology. This slide is self-explanatory. ISRO has developed a system called NAVIC. Navigation with Indian Constellation. This NAVIC set of satellites is expected to replace GPS in our country. Today, all of us depend on GPS in order for our mobile, especially when you have to go from one place to another, or you have to find a location, or you tell somebody where you are and where they can come. This is going to be replaced with Indian satellites very soon. Uh, more details I will tell you. Navik, how it started was during Kargil War of 98, India was refused GPS data by USA, which we required for the Army as well as for the Air Force. 
to target enemy positions. Since we didn't get the help of USA, they switched off the GPS at that time for us. All satellites which are covering our area were blanked. And therefore, we never got any GPS data. So Indian government took a decision at that time that ISRO will make a suitable system for our area of interest. We are not looking at the whole world. We are only looking at India and the surrounding area. ISRO will make. And seven satellites were launched between 2013 and 2018 by ISRO. Now a little bit of technical detail. Three of the satellites are in geostationary orbit, which means when the Earth rotates, they are also rotating in the same speed. So as far as satellites are concerned, there is no relative motion between satellite and Earth. They keep looking at the same point because both Earth and satellites are rotating around at the same speed. So geostationary means their orbit is on equator. That's what it means. While geosynchronous means they are also rotating at the same speed, but they are rotating uh, at a different orbit, not at equator. In this case, 42 de degrees tilt. Why this is required is because you require at least three satellites uh, to give the position accurately of one point. When you want to know where your car is in uh, Kotaem, you require a fix from three different satellites. Then only they will triangulate and fix your position. So that is why you have some satellites in geostationary and some in geosynchronous. Okay, let's leave these technical issues. There are seven satellites there. They have been launched in such a way they will cover most of. India on land as well as the nearby sea. They will have a accuracy better than GPS because they will use more than one frequency. GPS is only one frequency. It's a little technical. So in the diagram which is on the left side, if you see three blue satellites, three blue satellites, they are geostationary and the four red satellites are geosynchronous. There's only a pictorial edition. And you can see these seven satellites are always illuminating the area of India's landmass and the seas surrounding the landmass. So we are able to get position of objects which is on land or in nearby region of the sea. <coughs> now, when NAVIC comes, it will reduce our dependence on GPS. You will be able to make maps both in 3D as well as in 2D. Uh, very high accuracy maps will be made for defense services with an accuracy of one meter, which is much better than GPS. GPS is around 11 meters accuracy. So this can go up to one meter. And we can also help Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bangladesh, Bhutan, if they want our help. At the moment, we are only looking at India. It is comparable and sometimes even better. The GPS of USA, GLOSNAS of Russia, Beidou of China, and Galileo of France. So we would become the fifth nation to give a satellite navigation system to our, our people, our vehicles, and various other installations, including defense. The mobile app, which is required for Navic, will be different from mobile app of GPS. So this mobile app is ready. It's undergoing trials. And at some stage, the government will release this mobile app uh, so that people can have this mobile app, whether it's an Android phone or whether it is an iPhone, they will have apps corresponding to it and they will be able to use Navic instead. They may have a choice of using GPS or Navic, but Navic will be soon available for 
India's mobile users. Very soon it will have. It is not yet released. And this national network will provide data to our citizens and to a higher accuracy and also with 3D uh, maps to the different systems. So this is the first technology which is coming in. I presume it will come sometime in early 23 uh, to all of us. I have a feeling that this will get released when 5G uh, telephone is also released in India. 5G is still not released, but it will get soon released by, let us say, another month or two. After that, the government may release this. This is what I think will happen, but let us see what will be the thing. Now I'm finished with technology one. Now I come to technology two. The first technology, as I told you, was Navic instead of sir, GPS. Sir, yeah. Uh, sir, language is okay, but the uh, concepts, if you make it a little more simpler, it would be nice. Uh, you want it uh, more simple, uh, less concept. technical. Take, um, uh, take, uh, language, uh, if you can make it a little more simpler. Uh, language is okay, but the concepts. Okay, so you want less technical. Okay, understood. Shaji okay. Matthew, understood. Thank you, sir. Okay, now the next technology which is going to come is regarding fast tag. All of us are avail, uh, aware of this, that your cars, when they go past a toll gate, there will be uh, a toll that a toll charges collected by Fastag. So let us see what is Fastag. Fastag is an RFID device. It is something like what is fitted on some items in supermarket, which they scan and they are able to tell that uh, this item is so and so item cost so and so etc. It will also uh, check any pilferage from the shop. If you take an item which has got an RFID uh, fitted on it, uh, that means it has not been billed and they will catch you at the gate. So fast tag is similar to that. It's an RFID. It's a radio frequency identity device. It is read at the toll gate by the sensor for it and your bank account will be deducted. But only one disadvantage. When you cross the toll gate, you pay some amount. Let us say 70 rupees you pay. But if after 5 kilometers you go away from the highway and you are not using the full highway, you don't get any discount. You pay the same 70 rupees. Just like another person who is using the full highway. So this is one disadvantage of fast tag. People are, some people are, many people are being, paying more than what they should. The second aspect is in fast tag, you need to slow down so that your RFID can be read by the sensor. And there'll be one vehicle at least in front of you. So you slow down, about 45 seconds is the average delay at the toll gate. So you lose some time and it also leads to vehicles mm. idling for that time. So there is some carbon emission. So considering this, there's a need where the vehicle going past can be detected even when it is going at 60 kilometers or 80 kilometers. So you require another system so that the delay can be reduced as well as the amount which is calculated is based on what you used. So I'll come to the technology. Today, in fast tag, you don't know where is the vehicle after it has crossed the toll gate. You don't know. It can turn right, left, go straight. So if the vehicle has to be tracked by authorities, let's say police or somebody else, they will not be able to do it because the next toll gate is some 50 kilometers away. So vehicle's position is not known through fast tag. Only when it crosses, you know it has crossed, but not thereafter. So government is examining two technologies to replace fast tag. 
two. So I will briefly tell without much technical issues how the fast tag will get replaced. First is again a GPS tracker. All the new cars coming in India today is fitted with a GPS tracker. Many of you may not be knowing it. It's a small box which is fitted in behind your steering wheel. It is fitted right inside. You can't see it unless you open the uh, covers and all that. This GPS tracker is able to receive signals from three GPS satellites. And that will decide by triangulation the position of your car whether it is at Kotem railway station junction or it is at on the highway, wherever it is. And that blue dot comes on your mobile. So when a blue dot comes on your mobile as the car position, it is given by the GPS tractor, tracker which is fitted in your car, which triangulates three GPS satellite signals. And therefore, if sat GPS is not there, if America switches off, USA switches off GPS, then this blue dot is not there in your mobile anymore. So let's go to the next point. The, there is a new concept which is coming, how you can charge the toll charges based on actual use. So I will show a diagram to you. The red box is a physical toll gate where now you're paying 70 rupees or 100 rupees. But if you don't pay that and you go pass along this highway, these green points, they are geofenced virtual toll gate. They are toll gates, but you don't have to stop. They are, they, you just drive past at the normal speed, full speed, whatever speed you want. It will pick up a signal from the GPS track, tracker fitted inside the car. So suppose you turn after the first blue circle, it will charge you only for that distance. If you go some more, past the second circle, it will charge you a little more. So in the toll collection is based on how much you are using. And these circles which I put here are selected in such a way that Cars are, are charged only for the use of the highway. Half a highway, one-fourth highway, two-third highway, whatever it is. So customers don't pay full charges. That is the principle in this. And more important, you don't stop at the toll gate. You just drive past as if it's an open road. Okay, so this is the concept. Second aspect is authorities will be able to track a moving car because it is going past those green circles. So if police wants to track your car, it is based on these signals from the virtual toll gate. They'll be able to find out where is the car now, where it has crossed one circle and where it is going. Not exactly you will know the position, but you will know where was it 10 minutes back, you will be able to know. So the disadvantage of this is, every car should have a GPS tracker. GPS tracker is coming only in new cars, not in old cars. So old cars are also fitted GPS tracker if they have to uh, use the GPS system. Second, there can be some legal issue that the government can track private cars. There can be some objection to it. So these are two negative aspects of this technology. And what will happen if GPS is switched off? Or what will happen if tomorrow Navik comes when GPS is removed from India? So this technology has got some doubts whether it will be useful for us or not. That is why I'm going to the second option, second technology. Second technology is automatic number plate reader. Please don't confuse with 
speed camera which is fitted in a highway. The speed camera fitted in a highway where they find out your speed if you're over speeding, etc., and you get a ticket for paying charges is not the same as automatic number plate reader. It uses a different technology. And very briefly, I'll tell you all cars since 2005 are fitted with high security registration plate. That means there's a commonality of the number plate in India. Even though many people have been writing their number, <coughs> registration number, uh, sometimes in uh, Hindi, sometimes in uh, Kannada, etc. They have been writing, which is not correct, which is illegal. But as per government one, they are supposed to form a particular code. The day-night cameras, which are going to be fitted for ANPR, will read your number plate about 25 meters away within a very short period of time. And there are multiple cameras which will compute your speed. So it is two things will happen. One, your number plate will be read very clearly. And second, your multiple cameras will compute the speed. This technique is different from the technology used in speed camera, which is presently fitted on a highway. So this is how it will be. There'll be one set of cameras here. There'll be another set of cameras here. And that this distance is known and the cameras will, the car will go and they will find out how much time it has taken from one to another and calculate your speed. Today, uh, speeds are calculated by speed camera using a different uh, technology called Doppler frequency, uh, which has got some limitations. So this is a better technology, which is going to be introduced in India. Right. Now, uh, the camera uses, uh, I can't, sorry. Uh, the trials have been started in Delhi Agra Highway in August 22. And the government will decide soon whether they want GPS or ANPR. So this technology is fast tag will go away. And one of the two, GPS or ANPR will come. I think ANPR will come because GPS as such is going to be removed from our mobiles by Navic. So therefore, ANPR is a likely technology which is going to come in the next one year, which will make our travel speedier and safer. Now I go to uh, what has been the experience of other countries. Many Western countries have gone for ANPR. Their cameras read 92% of the time, even if it is raining. The camera data which is given will help the toll collection to be based on the use of the owner up to what distance he used. So there'll be not one off toll gate which you pay, you will pay pro rata to the use. Camera data can be used for tracking your vehicle suspected in some crime by authorities, they can track it. And no report is required from the vehicle. No GPS tracker is to be fitted in the car. So if a car does not have a GPS tracker because the old model, or the owner removes a GPS tracker in the car. Uh, those things are not affecting ANPR technology. So I think ANPR will come in our uh, country very soon, maybe next year. And it will not interfere with Navic if it comes. If Navic comes instead of GPS, then we will not have any problem in this technology. So I have covered two digital technologies. First is ISRO's Navic and second is fast tag removal and most likely to be replaced with automatic number plate reader technology.
So now I'll go to green technology one. Liquid hydrogen. You must have read in the papers recently, many uh, recent developments which are taking place in liquid hydrogen. And liquid hydrogen is nothing new. We have always been using liquid hydrogen, uh, definitely for spacecraft. ISRO uses it in a big way because it has got high intensity energy, which is required for launching satellites. So liquid hydrogen is very much required for spacecraft. Liquid hydrogen is also required for other industrial applications, which I will touch upon, uh, like steel, refinery, and uh, fertilizer. I will come to it later. So now, a new developed technology has come in India, where liquid hydrogen will be fitted in what's called a fuel cell. Fuel cell is a small electrical equipment in which you put liquid hydrogen through some pipes. It will take oxygen from the air and produce electricity. Can you imagine this? Liquid hydrogen will combine with oxygen in the air and produce electricity. And that electricity can drive your car. This is the concept. Now, these fuel cells have been designed to electrically drive trains, small ships, cars, and even submarines. Of course, for submarines, you can't take oxygen from air. It has to be because they are not above water. So they will take oxygen from storage tank. So fuel cell technology uh, will bring in a great revolution that car will not require petrol or diesel. Car will require only liquid hydrogen. You put liquid hydrogen in your car and you drive off. It will take oxygen from air and produce electricity and electricity will charge your battery and your car will be an electric car running on liquid hydrogen. So this is a new technology which is coming in, but there's a small problem. Liquid hydrogen can substitute petrol and diesel and it can reduce footprint, carbon footprint also. But liquid hydrogen is slightly vulnerable. That cylinder which will carry the liquid hydrogen has to be kept very safely in the car. You must have seen many cars run on LPG, many cars run on CNG. There's a cylinder at the back of the car. That is a risk. If the car is involved in a collision, the LPG cylinder, or the CNG cylinder can explode. Similarly, liquid hydrogen can also explode, in fact, explode with very severe uh, intensity if the car is involved in a collision. So liquid hydrogen has got a problem. But now that I'm on liquid hydrogen, let me tell you some terms which, uh, which you will start reading in paper very soon. You have green hydrogen, when this hydrogen is produced, actually, how do you get hydrogen? It is not available in the air in sufficient quantity. You have to do electrolysis of H2O, that is water, and split the water into hydrogen and oxygen. So hydrogen has to be made using electricity. If that electricity is from a solar panel or a wind farm, it's called green hydrogen. If Hydrogen is made from natural gas, which is running the plant, electrolysis plant. It's called blue. If it's from nuclear energy, it's called pink, like that. If it's from coal, it's black. So there are different types of hydrogen, green, blue, pink, etc. Why I'm saying this is price of an item using green hydrogen is more expensive in the market today. I'll take a an example. Steel, you requires hydrogen. Producing steel in a steel plant requires green hydrogen. I'm sorry, requires hydrogen. If you use green hydrogen, it is called green steel and is more expensive. So if you're using green hydrogen for fertilizer, it's called green fertilizer and it is more expensive. 
because the carbon footprint of green hydrogen production is less. Just remember that there is something called green hydrogen, which is the purest form of hydrogen you can get in the world today. That much you remember. So this is how the car will look. There's a hydrogen tank here. There's a fuel cell here. It will take air from outside and charge the battery and the car will run. Electric car. But running on fuel cell and hydrogen. So advantages, these vehicles don't pollute atmosphere because it will only release uh, H2O, hydrogen and oxygen will combine and produce water or steam. So it will release some steam into the air. That's all. No carbon dioxide, no carbon monoxide. So pollution is significantly less when you use a hydrogen car. Hydrogen cost, running cost of a car is slightly lower than petrol, even though fuel cells are a little expensive. As I told you earlier, hydrogen cars have a risk of explosion or collision. So hydrogen is preferred in trains, ships, small uh, inland vessels, but not desirably in cars. So this technology of green hydrogen for cars may not take off in India. We have to find some other way of producing electricity for running our cars and not hydrogen. But hydrogen is required in other opportunities are there for hydrogen. First, it is used in refineries to remove sulfur from petrol. It is used in steel plants to convert iron ore to sponge iron. It is used in fertilizer factories to produce ammonia, which is required for fertilizer production. So liquid hydrogen is required for us. We require 10 million tons of hydrogen annually. If it is green variety, very good. Today, we don't have much of green variety. We have only a very small quantity of green hydrogen being made in the country. So what the government has done is, they have formed a national hydrogen mission to produce green energy. That means it has to be from renewable energy. I'm sorry, green hydrogen from renewable energy. That means either solar or wind. So they have minimum carbon footprint and they can export also if they got extra. And this mission has been formed and they formed an alliance within the country uh, with some industry majors, like the name I have given there, Adani, Reliance, LNT, IOC, who can manufacture green hydrogen by electrolysis. Green hydrogen means automatically it's in renewable energy and create five hubs in India for distribution to steel plant, fertilizer plants, refineries, etc. May not be so much for running cars. It will be used for industry. Okay. Now, since green hydrogen is not suitable for cars, how do you reduce the carbon footprint? How do you reduce the pollution of cars? So there is a new thing called methanol blended fuel. That means you add methanol to your petrol. You add methanol to your diesel. Methanol is generated from either biomass or high ash coal, which is there in India very much, or natural gas. You produce methanol. Up to 15% of petrol can be substituted by methanol. No negative effect. It will reduce greenhouse gas emission also by 20%. So methanol blending is a new technology which is coming in. Indian Oil uh, Corporation has already uh, launched in May 22, three, four months back a new fuel called M15, that means 15% is methanol. It is being produced in a refinery in Assam, which can be used for vehicles, trucks, inland vessels. When I say inland vessels, small ships, diesel generators, etc., etc. So this methanol would be our immediate aim. We already started production in Assam. When that comes, 
you will be able to get methanol blended fuel, M15, and your cars, your vehicles will release less pollution, will be cost. Our production is only 2 million tons now, but is expected it will go to 20 million tons by 2025. So it will Ex definitely... Excuse me, sir. Excuse sorry, me, sir. Uh, Sorry, this uh, methanol blended fuel. Can I, I can see. I take the questions at the end, please, Joby? Okay, okay, sir. Right, thank you. Uh, so methanol uh, will be uh, produced up to twenty million tons by twenty twenty five, and we will be reducing crude import. Very important for us for our economy. We are importing crude, so we don't have to import crude oil. It will reduce and we will substitute methanol in petrol and diesel and reduce pollution. So both on pollution front, as well as on import front, we will stand to gain with this new technology. Now, methanol, methanol economy that is based on this methanol blending and utilizing and distribution, etc., people see as a stepping stone for green hydrogen economy. And when both get combined, our oil imports will significantly reduce, which is good for the economy and good for pollution control. And our carbon footprint will come down. The number of tons of carbon we are releasing into air will come down. So with this, I finish the first green technology, which is pertaining to liquid hydrogen and methanol blended fuel. With methanol blended fuel taking the lead, coming first, and liquid hydrogen will come slightly later, especially green hydrogen, which is produced from renewable energy. Now we come to second technology, green technology, very simple. All of us know lithium ion batteries. Many of you have got electrical cars, you know it's fitted with a lithium ion battery. Even small mobiles have got lithium ion batteries. There are many uh, electrical equipment which have got lithium ion batteries. The problem with lithium ion batteries is this, uh, which is very much required for electrical vehicles, is we don't have lithium mines in India. We don't have lithium produced in India in sufficient quantity. We have to import lithium or buy finished lithium ion battery from China, mostly from China. So we have an economy problem if we go the lithium way. Lithium will not be supporting our economy. We have to find another way of substituting lithium ion battery. And that is what IIT Madras has done in May 22, four months back. IIT Madras has developed a new battery called zinc air battery. That means it will use zinc and take air from the atmosphere and produce electricity. The trials are over. It is getting ready for production. The cost is to be only 55% of lithium ion battery, which you know after some time will be very high when China has got monopoly in lithium ion batteries and zinc air battery can be recharged just like lithium ion lithium ion can be recharged electrically but zinc air battery can be charged recharged mechanically i will tell you what is the difference very simple but this is how the literature says zinc batteries can be recharged mechanically Zinc air battery has got high energy capacity, long shelf life. We have got lots of zinc in India. In India has got high reserves of zinc. So we got zinc, they got the technology, we can substitute lithium ion batteries, and the cost is low. The only problem is it has to be mechanically recharged, which means I will come to that now. This cassette, which is inside the battery, has to be taken out when the battery is almost dead and put a new cassette. You will change the cassette. Just like you change the battery in your remote of your TV, 
just like that. Of course, this is much heavier. You remove this cassette and put a new cassette and return this cassette to the supplier. It goes back to the industry for recharging and will come back for recycling. So zinc cassettes can be replaced. Cassettes will be recycled. And many industries are ready to start IIT Madras's new technology of zinc air battery, which will substitute lithium ion in Indian cars and other applications where presently lithium ion is used. So it's a great development which has happened five months back. And I presume next year we will have link zinc air uh, batteries fitted vehicles in the market. So I finished the second green technology. Now I'll come to the last green technology. Number three, this is going to affect each one of you, whether you have a car or whether you have uh, uh, some requirement for a fuel cell, etc. This is on smart energy meter. Today, now this is a very serious topic. Today, the 20% of our power is lost due to transmission and distribution. 20% while global average is only 7.5%. So, you have a situation that we lose a lot of energy, power, Tamil Nadu Electricity Board, Kerala Electricity Board, any electricity board in India will have this problem. Okay. So, what do we do? Second problem is our building efficiency is only 85%. Even though you issue 100% bills, many bills are at flat rate because meter is not working. So you have a problem, a lot of money is lost. No wonder uh, discom companies are running into losses. A lot of money is lost because of transmission distribution problem and you don't know how to fix it. I will tell you why you're not able to fix it. And billing efficiency is poor. Now comes smart meter to overcome this problem and make the consumer aware. So I will tell you a little more on this. Slightly technical, bear with me. You have an electricity meter in your house. It will tell you how much power you're consumed. Till that point of time, you're looking at the meter. You go in the morning and see, oh, I've consumed 100 units. You go in the evening and say, I've consumed 110. Oh, during the day, I've consumed 10, 10 units. This you can't do every day. You can't be looking at the meter every hour to see how much have you consumed. Smart meter is a digital interface. It will tell you by SMS. It will tell you by WhatsApp how much power you are consumed during the day. You want every hour, it will give you a report every hour. If you want once in four hours, it will give you a report once in four hours. It will not only tell you, it will also tell the electricity board what is the power uh, Dr. Sabu's house has consumed from morning till evening and the night, etc. So the consumer becomes more aware, department becomes more aware. Now, why is the department important in this? Let us say there are 100 houses in the society, 100 houses, that means 100 meters. If the, if the electricity board is supplying 1,000 units, or consume 1,000 units in a day, if I add up all the 100 units houses consumption, it should come to ideally 1,000, but it will not come to 1,000, it will come to 900 something. But the gap between the 1,000 and the sum of all the houses in that society is the loss. 
this loss can be due to many reasons. One reason could be in distribution, there is some loss. During peak hours, many people are switching on AC. When many people switch on AC, the current goes up of the transformer in the street and the loss of the transformer goes high. When everybody switches off AC, the loss comes down because loss is proportional to the load. So the department will be able to very carefully look at how is the load changing from morning six o'clock to night 10 o'clock in this society, in this street, in this whole ward, they can, in this whole district, they can do all this profiling they can do and find out why is the loss high. It can also detect if there's a theft, if there is a pilferage, it'll be able to do it. I give 1,000 units to this street, but all the people put together is only coming to 700. Where is the 300 going? I can understand 100 is lost. 200, somebody is pilfering. Somebody is taking away the electricity. All these things you'll be able to uh, find out very clearly using the smart meter. The department will become more accountable because this data will be in the public domain. So therefore, smart meters are going to be the answer. It's already come abroad. We are going to bring, I'll tell you where we are in India now. Smart meters will educate you, will ed make the department more efficient. Now, one interesting aspect which Tamil Nadu has come last week. Last week, Tamil Nadu has said, if you consume power between 6 o'clock and 10 o'clock in the morning or 6 o'clock and 10 o'clock in the night, you'll be charged at a higher rate. I don't think it is there in Kerala now, but Tamil Nadu has already come with an uh, idea. Why I say an idea is, Today's energy meter cannot charge you like that. The reading will not tell you whether you consume between 6 o'clock and 10 o'clock or 10 o'clock and 4 o'clock. It cannot tell you. Only a smart meter can tell you at what time of the day or night you consume power. The profile is not available in today's energy meter. So tomorrow's energy meter, which is smart meter, can bring in this new law. If you consume power between 4 o'clock and 6 o'clock in the morning, you give only less rate. It's already been tried out in Japan. Japan has already brought this law. If you consume power between 4 o'clock and 6 o'clock in the morning, you pay less tariff. So everybody washes clothes in some of these Japanese cities early morning before it is 6 o'clock. Consumer is aware. Consumer is helping to flatten the peak load, is reducing the peak load, which is otherwise causing losses. So look at this, consumers participation in reducing electricity losses by flattening the peak. So where are we in this? So what the government has done, they formed a JV, joint venture of public sectors, to install, to supply and install 25 crore smart meters in various states of the country. They will come after discussing with Kerala State Electricity Board or Tamil Nadu State Electricity Board and fit the meter and go back, commission it and go back. How does the meter look? This is how the meter will look. They have already installed 44 lakhs meters in UP, Delhi, Rajasthan. Haryana, Andhra Pradesh, and Kerala have accepted it. They're not yet started. You may have read in local papers that Kerala is going to start it. In Delhi, they find revenue collection has become higher after this meter has been fitted. The revenue collection has become higher. That means theft and pilferage, as well as flattening of peak, losses reduction, all have taken place. Soon, a mobile app will come so that customer can monitor. They're also looking at prepaid option. You can pay in advance for 100 units during time your family is going to be having guests, etc. So you don't want any interruptions. You want to buy more power, you can take over for a free prepaid option also. 
So this is the development on smart meters. It is going to bring in reduction in losses of electricity. Moment the electricity reduction uh, losses are less. Kerala will take less electricity from Idiki or Pallavasam or from national grid. They will take less. So national grid will produce less and the carbon footprint of the country will reduce a little bit. So all this is aimed at greening our atmosphere, reducing the carbon footprint of our industries, which are producing electricity by burning coal. Now I come to the sixth technology, which I added. I'll take two, three minutes more. So let me just see the digital technology number three, last one. All of you have got debit cards and credit cards. Now, today you go to a shop and buy an item, you give a debit card or a credit card. What happens at the time, I will just tell you, and then I'll tell you what is this new technology which is coming in to India. It's already come in some places. Today you're going to shop and buying it by swiping on a machine called POS machine. Point of sales, that's what POS means, POS machine or you buy through the net. And the disadvantage in this is your card number and the name is with the merchant who's selling the item to you. And this has led to a lot of fraud from your bank account. Your bank account has become less safe because people have been able to use this data to take away money from your account. This is what the RBA study has done. So I will tell you how it looks today. Today's picture is like this. Customer goes to Amazon, uh, to Amazon portal, orders an item, gives the card details. Amazon sends it to Visa. I'm taking Visa as a card example. It goes to the Visa card server. Visa card server sends to your bank, let's say state bank, which sends an OTP to you. You reply the OTP and the money is paid to Amazon. This is what happens. Everything is okay. Your card detail, which is there with bank, is there with Visa, but the card details are given to the merchant called Amazon. Amazon is able to have access to this data. And if somebody can take away the data from Amazon, your name, your card details, what type of card, etc. All this will be known for any fraudulent activity later. So the government wants to make it difficult for any fraudulent one. So how is it happening? Let us see. So what has done Reserve Bank of India, I said all credit cards, all debit cards, their data will not be shared with the merchant. And instead, they will get a mathematically constructed token, which will be developed, as I'll tell you in the diagram. So when you, when Amazon sends your token here, uh, what I've shown you is the first time, First time the token is made by Visa, it is shared with bank server and it is known to you. Only the last four digits are same as card known to you. Next time you do it, when customer has to buy an item from Amazon, then the token is given and that token goes straight to bank. Bank knows it is your account, Dr. Sabu's account. It will send an OTP to him. And when the OTP is replied, the payment is made. So your bank, uh, the card details are not known to the merchant. And this process of tokenization is in progress now. And the last date is, I'm repeating, last date is 30th September 22, this month. This month, the tokenization program is getting closed. So those of you who want this additional protection, please get your 
tokens from your card server. That means you go to Visa or you go to your bank and tell them I want tokenization done. They will tell you, you go to this bank uh, on the net and say you want a token and they will tokenize your card. Therefore, your data is not given to uh, the merchant from whom you are buying the item. This is going to make your money more safe and it is expected that much of the fraudulent deals which are happening will significantly reduce. With this, I finished the last digital technology. So let's take a quick uh, summary of the technologies which I have done. Three digital technologies and three green technologies. Digital, Navic by SRO, fast tag to be replaced mostly by number plate reader. Third one will be tokens for your debit card and credit card. Three green technologies, hydrogen and methanol. Methanol to be in the first and hydrogen to follow. That is the first one. Second green technology, I talk, talked about zinc air batteries to replace lithium. Zinc is available in the country, cheaper and therefore. And the last one, uh, which, which I talked about was the smart meter, which is going to get fitted in every house in the country and those of you who are in Kerala, Kerala government has already signed the MOU and soon they will be signing the contract with that uh, JV, PSU, EESL to fit the smart meters in each one of your house. Right, so conclusions are digital technologies like Navic or GPS, ANPR, which will substitute the fast tag, will make services safer for smooth travel and unrestricted satellite data for different services. This is a very important aspect. Second, digital tokenization of cards will improve protection against frauds. Third, green technologies like liquid hydrogen, which is bridged to methanol, methanol first and then liquid hydrogen, zinc air battery, smart energy meter, promise reduction in overall carbon footprint, boost our exports, as well as efficiency of electricity boats in the power sector, most important. They're all running in losses and we are all paying higher tariffs to make sure they are not in absolute red. So with this, power sector will become more efficient. And lastly, oil imports will get reduced because we have found substitutes by methanol. We have found electrical vehicles are coming in with zinc air battery. Smart energy meters are reducing our load on uh, electricity board, which are getting power from national grid, which run diesel and uh, natural gas. So oil imports will reduce. And our schemes will enable India to achieve its international commitments made in Glasgow summit regarding climate control by 500 gigawatts of solar power and 1 billion tons of carbon footprint to be reduced. With this, ladies and gentlemen, I have uh, finished my presentation and uh, um, I can take some questions in case uh, there are any.